is a seminal civil rights 2.0 what are you doing every single day moment this is it there is a lot of responsibility with that word activism whether you have a voice or not either you talk about it or you be about it and you do about it i don't care how you fight fight until your voice is heard you have a voice if you did not have a voice you wouldn't be here when we see something that is not right not fair not just we have a moral obligation to speak up and speak out and do something about it. We stand against the hatred. We stand against the violence. Even in the darkest hour, we saw the healing power of love to light a path forward to an age of equality. We made a decision to march in an orderly fashion from Selma to Montgomery. But last year, I had the honor to go back to Selma, and it was my honor to introduce President Barack Obama. So when people tell me nothing has changed, I feel like saying, come and walk in my shoes, and I will show you change. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Equality Officer Tony Prophet. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. We have got a delightful treat in store for you today. And I'm not going to preempt that in any way. Just going to frame the conversation a little bit with what's going on in the world. And um, we're at an inflection point. We are at an inflection point in human history. And anyone who's paying attention, you just know it, right? You feel it from the unprecedented and worrisome events that are happening in civil society, you know, not just in the US, but you know, around the world to the growing and pervasive effects of technology have on every facet of our existence. And those growing impacts of technology, you know, those we're calling the fourth industrial revolution. And, you know, you think back to the last 200 years of human history, how much has changed? And that first industrial revolution where humankind finally unleashed the true power of fire to the power of the steam engine. And before that point in time, everything as a civilization that we accomplished, we accomplished through the power of our muscles or through the power of domesticated animals. But in this moment, in this instant, in that age, we began to free our bodies. And then that second wave of technology and the invisible powers of electricity and magnetism that allowed our society to be organized the way that it is and to have urbanization and elevators and lighting and air conditioning and all the things that create the society as we know it today. And then came that third and powerful wave through the magic of the transistor, miniaturized through Moore's Law and then lit up by software created by these original programmers, Grace Hopper, for example, the people that began and founded that third industrial revolution. But this next one, this next revolution, and we're at the dawn of it. Buckle up, because it's going to change everything. And all of those technologies, machine learning, and AI, and drones, and robotics, and CRISPR, and gene editing, it's going to redefine every aspect of our existence, from education to what it means to have a job, to every facet of communication and how we communicate and engage with each other. And the question that we are asking ourselves, the question that you all, everyone here in the room, those watching online should be asking themselves is, are we creating a better world? The world that we're creating for the next generation, are we creating a better world for this next generation? So here at Salesforce, we frame this around three themes. First, in the fourth industrial revolution, the first is equal rights standing for the equal value of every human life, every human life in this room, every human life in the city, every human life on the planet of equal value. And increasingly, these difficult questions about the ethical use of technology in our society and the unintended consequences, and that technology not be weaponized. We've all got to ask ourselves those questions. We certainly here at Salesforce, we're wrestling with these things. We don't have all the answers, but we're committed to getting this right and being a leader. And then finally, in all of our institutions, whether they're corporations, nonprofit, government institutions, building a culture of equality. 
And for us at Salesforce, this notion of a culture of equality is we drive it around the principle of being an ally. And this principle of being an ally is a core lesson that was imprinted on me, really tattooed on me by my middle son. And about four years ago, my son's a senior at college today, he gave this button right here. That's that button. And I carry this with me literally all over the world. Wherever I go, I have this button. And early days, he took me to the QRC, the Career Resource Center, at his college. He gives me this button and says, put this on. And there's something powerful about publicly declaring yourself to be an ally. It's transformative versus, you know, secretly saying, well, I'm an ally, but, you know, the headwinds come and the crosswinds come and you, you can step away if you don't have that public commitment. There's also something important about the notion of being an ally. Declaring yourself to be someone's ally does not mean that you agree. It doesn't mean that you agree on every political issue, every social issue, every lifestyle choice. It's that notion of family. If any of you, if you're in a family, and if more than one person's in that family, you don't agree on everything, but you stand together as brothers and sisters and siblings in times of crisis and in times of joy and in times of celebration. That's the power of being an ally. And we try to live that out every day here at Salesforce. We're imperfect, but we try. Perfect example. The focus of our ally alliances are our employee resource groups. And this one, these are the leaders of Bold Force, the employee resource group for the blacks of Salesforce. And what I love about this picture is back there in that baseball hat is a person. His name's Charlie Isaacs. He might be in the room, right? He doesn't identify as black. He's an ally. But, but he's there. I'm not sure if he's supposed to be in the picture or if he's photobombing the picture. But there he is. There he is as an ally. And this moment was the MLK March in San Francisco. Now, back in 2017 for the MLK March, we had about 100 people showed up here in San Francisco, most of them black. Then we had a call for allies. And in 2018, 1,100 people showed up, most of them not black. The power, the power of alliances and those folks standing with you. So, you know, this was January 15th. Now on January 16th, you show up for work black the next day. And even though you're still underrepresented, you don't feel so alone because I saw you there, and I saw you there, and you were there with your kids, and you brought your dog, right? And you see all these folks that you know are your allies. doesn't mean they agree with you on every single issue, but you know that they're there, and they're standing with you. It can be super, super powerful. So we had another experience like this just a month later, and this is February 19th in Hyderabad, India. And we have some amazing, amazing trailblazers. I won't call them all out by name, and the trailblazers there in Hyderabad and one of our employee resource groups is called Outforce. And that's the employee resource group for the LGBTQ folks at Salesforce and their allies. But we did not have an Outforce chapter in India. And so we went on February 19th to stand with our employees and the champions in Hyderabad to march in Pride. Now, those of you who have been to Pride here in San Francisco, it could be a million people. Hyderabad, maybe 500 people. Salesforce participating for the first time, 50 folks. For us, it was powerful, this idea that we're going to stand with the LGBTQ folks in Hyderabad at Salesforce. There's only one problem. Nobody was out, not one person. It's February 19th. Hyderabad office, February 20th. One person, one brave soul comes out. And you think about you know, the tapes that we all play about our identity and we see ourselves through that lens of our identity and, you know, living your life, coming into work every day and working not to out yourself and trying to triangulate on what you told someone the last time and the time before and just trying to make sure you do all that calculus and that huge tax and stress and anxiety. And it could be 30, 40, 50% of your mental power just trying not to out yourself. And in that moment, when that person came out, he was free. And so when people ask about the business value of equality. You're surrounded, whatever endeavor you are involved in. If you're in school, if you're at work, if you're working for a nonprofit, if you work for a government agency, you're surrounded every day by people playing those tapes. And when they can be free and they can be their authentic self at work, that changes everything. And then in India, September 6, we got some great news. And the Supreme Court of India made this decision 
that began an important step, a necessary step, a long overdue step for freedom and equality for the LGBTQ community in India. So it was a moment that we celebrated. And so the spirit of Salesforce with our Ohana, right, which includes not just our employees, but our customers and our partners and the communities in the school is this notion of family. And one of the amazing things about family, one of the most important things about family is building shared memories. And for us, we've got a lot of them. I shared some of them from the MLK March. Some of the most incredible shared memories we have are around pride. And so just going to reminisce for a bit and share with you a little family video of some of the moments of celebrating pride in 2018 around the world with Salesforce. As human beings, we are all wired for connection, and connection is defined by a deep sense of love and belonging. Belonging, to me, means that you never have to hide who you truly are. Belonging, I would say, is a feeling of being wanted and safe in a community, even if they're full of people that are completely different from you. Belonging for me is uh, being part of a community, like friends, family, or company, and to be who I am and feel free to do what I want. I think everyone deserves to love who they are and be who they want to be. But whether you're at work, whether you're at home, or whether you're walking down the street, you should be accepted for who you are. Everyone deserves to feel like they belong in a community, and Salesforce develops that community for our employees and our friends. No matter who you are, you can find your home here. Being allies is an important step in creating a larger community, and that larger community is how we stay safe, happy, and how we create that sense of belonging that we all need and crave as humans. Regardless of who you're in love with, you should be able to celebrate that and be public about it and not be ashamed or have to hide yourself. I believe everyone should have the right to do what they want, marry who they want, be who they want. And if I can help fight for that, then I definitely want to be an ally. It's all about support, feeling that you're part of something, and, and just helping everyone along. And everybody deserves equality. There's this saying that says the queers and the LGBT folks are like butterflies. When you see them out flitting about you, you know the environment is healthy. Without friends, without family, without community and allyship, none of us would be as successful as we are. So it's important to think about who needs an ally and to show up and to speak up. We all have a role to play on the path to equality. If we all come together and work together to show up for our LGBTQ community, then that's when we'll start to see real change and then every person will feel like they belong. The only point of being here is if we can all be here. We really need allies and the support of everyone to make sure that the world is an equal place for all. Every single movement is sparked by someone speaking out, but it gains momentum when allies join the cause. We can never forget the importance of standing with others. That's what's going to take us to equality for all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome senior editor, Fortune Magazine, Ellen McGirt. Ah, let me take a moment, look at, take you all in. You are all so beautiful to me. Thank you for having me again. You want to meet some equality trailblazers? Because I got two for you. I got two for you, and I love them, and I know you do too. Skating champion Adam Rippon won our hearts during his remarkable performance and presence at the 2018 Winter Olympics. His bronze medal win made him the first openly gay U.S. male athlete to win a medal in the Winter Games. We're going to talk about all that. Tracy Ellis Ross has been winning our hearts for a while now. Um, as an actor and model and comedian, director and television host, she became our, the best friend that we never knew we needed as Joan Clayton in the comedy series Girlfriends. And now she's the doctor we'd love to love, Rainbow Johnson in the, in the comedy series Blackish. Now, I know they work in very different entertainment fields, but in this one way, as I've come to see, they're extraordinarily alike. They both bring an unmitigated, effervescent joy to absolutely everything they do, to their day jobs, to their online feeds, to the way they interact with their fans, but also to the very serious work that they both do to advance the causes of civil rights, justice, equal pay, and equal rights. That spirit and dedication is so rare in this troubled world, it gives me hope and joy for the important work ahead. 
Their belief in the idea of equality is as inextricably linked in their hearts as they are in ours. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming friends, Adam Rapon and Tracy Ellis Ross. <laughs> Hey, everybody. <laughs> There's howls already. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> oh, aren't they beautiful? Yeah, they're so beautiful. <laughs> He's really beautiful. Look at his oh. profile. <laughs> I die. <laughs> Look at her boots. Look oh, at her boots. this profile? <laughs> yes, that one. We should just sit like this the whole time. <laughs> Can we go back to the very beginning? This is the closest thing I ever get to feel like Oprah, so I'm going to ask you about your childhood. Is that okay? <laughs> and not your balance sheet or anything I usually ask the business executives. Um, let's start, let's go back to the very beginning. Tracy, if it's okay, I'm going to ask you to, to sure. go first here. Um, I want to hear all about Christmases with the Ross cousins in Detroit <laughs> and traveling the world and dancing on stages. And uh, most importantly, how you grew up helped you become the magnificent spirit you are today. Adam, some <sighs> questions coming to you next. Let's see. Um, well, I was born in Los Angeles. Uh, lived there until my mom was moving to New York to do The Wiz. Um, we all went to New York in 79, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Went to school, went to school. I know, she's, she's okay. <laughs> anyway, um, went to school in New York. Then I actually moved to Paris um, and then Switzerland. And then I moved home and we lived in Connecticut. Um, and then... <laughs> 95. Yeah. 95. Connecticut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no Paris. Um, and then I went to Brown University. Um, I was very shy growing up, um, but my shyness, I know it's funny, but <laughs> my shyness manifested in a really large personality, um, which in essence does the same thing. It keeps people at a distance. Um, I also was always really joyful. My actual real middle name is Tracy. I'm Tracy Joy Silverstein is my name. That's what I was born. That's on my birth certificate. And my mom said I came out joyful. Um, and I think that honestly joy has propelled me through my life. Uh, I also hold with that the contrast. Um, and I, I hold a quietness and a, um, a, a sadness as well that I make space for. That's where my art lives, somewhere in between. Um, but I was always a joyful, sort of outspoken young girl. Um, and as I, in college, I, was, I studied theater and sort of started to find a way to express myself that didn't feel as frightening. Um, and I started to explore the idea of um, owning and learning who I was and, and my, own, my own experience, my likes, my dislikes, and all of that. And that has kind of taken me into being this woman that I am today. I obviously had a wonderful example and a very strong mother um, who lived in her, lives and lived in her full glory and agency and was choiceful about um, curating her own life and doing things her own way outside of the cultural norms. Um, and so I, I had that kind of example and my aunt as well is an incredibly strong, extraordinary woman. So my childhood started with those kinds of examples. But I could talk forever and I'm much older than you. So, what about your chest? <laughs> Which was what, yesterday? Well, yeah. It was yesterday. Amazing! Look what you've done with yourself. I know, it's crazy. Well, I was born in Scranton until my mom, Woo. Uh, thank you, until my mom did the whiz. <laughs> You can play at that. <laughs> um, she wasn't in the Wiz. <laughs> I die. Not even in the Scranton version. <laughs> uh, I just want you guys to know you're witnessing a new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beginning of it. <laughs> uh, oh boy. Um, so yeah, I was born in Scranton at Mercy Hospital, um, but. Uh, 
very similar to you. I was a really shy kid, mm. which is crazy because now I wear like a turtleneck whenever I want. And um, <laughs> I'm dying. I'm trying to tell my story. <laughs> you are telling it beautifully. Thank you. Um, I'm dying. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. Both our moms were in the whiz. I know. <laughs> you were turtleneck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm putting it back together. Um, so I uh, was really shy as a kid. Mm. And um, really insecure about who I was. But I loved to make people laugh. Mm. I loved to entertain people. And... Um, you know, as a young kid, sometimes that got me into a little bit of trouble. Um, every time I was skating, I always skated in, um, like, alone, because I, uh, there's not a big, booming community in Scranton, so <laughs> I had to travel, and so when I was 13, um, that was the first time I moved away from home. Mm. And um, I, I lived with one of my coaches for about five years. Wow. And, um, you know, I also, I was skating at like outside of Philadelphia and, um, Philly, class. Philly. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> thank you. I know. We have a big Connecticut like, crowd. We were listening to the story. Nobody wants to say anything about yeah. <laughs> Connecticut went crazy. Yeah, Connecticut. Man. We have the Liberty Bell. I know. Um, so I, I skated out there and I was, I skated mostly like by myself, so every time I'd go to a competition, it was, I, I always remember, like, I had no friends. Hmm. And um, I just remember thinking, like, oh my God, I, re I really wanna have friends when I go to a competition. And uh, I also remember getting older and I had started skating at different rinks that had a lot more skaters. So I started to make friends and I kind of came out of my shell a little bit. Um, but like as a really young gay kid from the middle of nowhere, I still felt really like uncomfortable in my own skin. I especially felt uncomfortable because in the skating world, everything that you do is like judged. Mm. Everything that you do is, there, someone has an opinion on it of how you can do it better or how it could be different. Mm. And there's also this like preconceived notion that everybody's already gay anyway. <laughs> Interesting. I didn't you expect you to say that. I'm not like helping, but I do. I'm one of six. You're one of six. Where yeah. are you in the lineup? Number one, baby. Number one. I'm number two. I'm number two. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, but like in, the, in that, fa I always kind of felt like a big brother, mm. but um, I still was like, I was insecure and it, it took me a really long time. It took me to like falling to like rock bottom within my career hmm. to not care and do things I wanted to do and say things that I wanted to say. Mm -mm. It was like in that rock bottom, which I feel like was missing the Olympic team for the second time in 2014 was when I became the outspoken person who I felt I always was, to be the role model that I wanted to have as a young kid from like Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. It was like in that moment where I gained all of the strength mm. that I needed to have to like really accomplish things mm. I wanted to. And you had been so poor at that point. I just remember going through your, you know, stealing apples from the gym and you know, the, the in and out burger saga and just, and I remember being a young professional one. I haven't turned out as well as either of you two, unfortunately. You're, you're clearly doing and, yeah, you're well. Fine. And I'm way older. <laughs> I'm way older. Don't sell yourself of... short. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on your honorary degree, by the way. We both went to Brown. Brown. I did not get one. <laughs> you know who got an honorary degree the year I graduated? No. Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> I yep. know, right? A it's like time. It's like ruined now. <laughs> yeah, he so, did a lot with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel better. Yeah. I feel better. Thank you. You, on the other hand, did a lot with you your You did, education. yes. I really tried yeah. hard. That's gonna be on my epitaph. Well, she gave it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> she showed hey, up. that's what's on mine. Back to you and your struggle, and then I, I, I yeah, want to- Back to me and my struggle. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> enough about 
about me. Then I want to move on to all kinds of other things. But we could just actually, to whatever you, you want to do. Struggle. I know. Back to you and your struggle. Because I do think that's an important part of what it is. You. It totally is. Because it forced me to do a lot of things that I didn't want to do, like ask for help, mm. um, say that I couldn't do something. I like. So when I moved to California, uh, I'm, I've been in California for six years now. Mm. And when I first moved to California, uh, it was. I told my mom I didn't want, it, I come from a really like hum, really humble beginnings. And my mom did everything she could to help me skate. And at this point, I just felt like I can't take that stress of letting my family down mm -hmm. if things don't go well. Like it needs to be my fault or it needs to be something that I can be really proud of that I was able to do. And I remember when I moved to California, I said, Mom, I, I don't want your help anymore. I want to be able to do this on my own. And of course, my mom fought about it because not that she was like, no, I want to give you money. <laughs> she, she was like, hey, take this. Um, she felt like it was me like cutting her out of my life, which it wasn't. I wanted to be responsible. But that also meant that there were a few times where like, I needed to decide like, how I was going to spend my money. And I remember I went to a Bank of America and I opened a checking account with um, 81 euros <laughs> because it was from a trip, a trip you had, had taken. Trip. Mm. And it was the only money I had. And I said, do you accept euros? Like I was some <laughs> stray did European you boy. Try, did you try and do it with an accent? Uh, will you do take you, these do, euros? Uh, how do you say, how do you say? How do you say, uh, monies? <laughs> You take these monies, yeah. rubles. Yeah, <laughs> look into my eyes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I tried. Um, so I went in and was like, that's all the money I have. So basically, once a week, I would buy a family size bag of trail mix. And I realized that I needed to pay for my ice and I needed to pay to go to the gym because right. if I wasn't going to the gym or skating, I wasn't, there was no point to this. So um, the only gym in Lake Arrowhead, which was a small mountain town where I was living, it was $50 a month. And I was like, how can I get the most bang for my buck? And it was like, I'm gonna take all the Granny Smith apples <laughs> and all the Tezo tea. So for like the first like four or five months that I lived in California, the only thing I ate were cashews, M&Ms, apples, and Tezo tea. Oh my God. And they were- And you were training. Yeah, but so thin. <laughs> the, the stomach was concave at the time. Yeah, I, I felt awful and was poor, but I looked amazing. <laughs> we are not promoting this. No, no, no. no we're not. We're not. No. Okay. <laughs> I wanted no. to make sure he was clear. No, I'm very much kidding okay. because it was, it was awful. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's, it's kind of humiliating, you know, when you go into the gym and you're like, I need to make sure nobody's looking so I can take all the apples, otherwise I won't eat anything. And I'm allergic to apples. Well, now, what? were you then? Or you are now because you ate so many? No, I was, like, I am always, like, on the verge of throwing up every time I have an apple. It was the only thing I had access to. And, um... I remember going to like going into like a Ralph's or a Stater Brothers, and um, I had my like limited amount of groceries, and I went and like swiped my card, and they're like, "Oh, it's not working." I'm like, "That's weird." <laughs> <laughs> I just was on a trip, and I'm like maybe I yeah, your I'll come back, and like you go into your Bank of America app, and it's like, "No, girl, you don't have money." <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> it's not. You make it really funny, but it's not funny. Oh, it's, it's hilarious not now. <laughs> no, I know. So it's not, I'm like, yeah. But it is not, and it sticks, it sticks with you, I know. It says, but like, it's the, one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because it brings out the Well, because I was able out the to bolt. say to my coaches, who were incredibly supportive, because I was living in his basement at the time, um, where he was like, you pay me when you can, but you have to make your, you have to get yourself out of this. And I'm going to help you in every way I can, but you're going to get yourself out of it. Yeah. And I did. Yes, you and did. It yes, was, yes, yes, you, you did. did. And um, then I was on The Wiz. <laughs> and now it's Tracy's turn. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. 
<laughs> I, I'm, I'm having a very nice time. I know, I, I know. very front row seat. And there's people here. I just, I, don't, I ordered a drink like 20 minutes ago. I'm with hoping the waiter will come out and find us one of these days. It sort of feels like we're at a cocktail. Oh, I was like, what? Look, I know. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> there's wait service here. Did you? <laughs> what did you order? I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to talk about the F word with you for a second. Feminist, you oh, claim feminism. God. I know. Nice segue. <laughs> um, you claim feminism. Mm. It is a scary word for some people. It's a complicated word. Mm. It has now become an intersectional conversation in all these interesting ways. Tell me about how you think about your feminism when you first decided that you were a feminist. You know, it's interesting. Um, my activism in general is something that has slowly evolved. I wasn't um, a Brown University right. feminist. I, I, um, I, uh, I think my, um, I too had uh, weird feelings about the word feminism because of all of the connotations that go along with it. I really thought it meant you wore Birkenstocks. I mean, that, that was the messaging that was out there when I was in college, you know what I mean? And I, I didn't really know the message that was connected to it. Um, what I have discovered as I've gotten older um, and sort of in blossoming into my own womanhood, that I have always been a person who was fighting for equality and for humanity and, um, and being an advocate for the vulnerable, even when that was me. I've always been an outspoken person and that ability to use my voice naturally transitioned into um, my advocacy work and my feminist beliefs. Um, I believe that feminism is the desire for all to be equal. Mm -hmm. um, it is about believing women. It is about listening to women. It is about access um, to opportunity and choice. Um, it is about our voices not being muted um, it is about supporting other women, um, leaning into the community of other women and the collective power and force of other women. Um, and in the feminine um, energy of matrilineal power as opposed to patriarchal power, there is a shared sense of power um, yes. th that, I, um, that I lean towards and that I thrive in and that I, um, I advocate for, you know? Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It does, it's a, it's a beautiful start to a mini segue because you are, again, with the effervescent joy which has been so beautifully on display today, but you also, both of you, but really exhibit grace and courage when you tackle these big issues, when you walk outside offset wearing black because you want to believe women, which you did, you know, and, and, and surround yourself with people who are doing it. By the way, not because I want to believe women. Oh, yes. Because I do believe women. Thank you. That's a good distinction. <laughs> because you want to make sure everybody knows. And I, and I, will, I will speak to that moment on Monday. Um, I was on set. And I'm not gonna lie, I was very nervous. We have majority men on our set. And um, using my voice along with that comes a lot of fear, a lot of doubt, a lot of shame um, that I lean into my community, my collective power of women to find support in that and to lean um, towards using my voice. And I don't know what other people's experience is, but since I was a little girl, when I see something that's unfair, or when I see the truth, something happens in my body, and it erupts. And I usually cannot help it. I mean, it, I cannot help it from coming out of my mouth. And I usually get a little shaky, and I have to say it, yeah. you know? Um, and I have, I'm grateful for my education, because what I have gained, and as I've gotten older, what I have um, yearned for and longed for is to remain teachable as I continue to listen and gain the language that I did not have growing up, that you can't have when you're growing up. That as you get older, you have a facility with language that allows me to actually express the angst that is inside me, express the truth that I see, and say it, and know that I am still holding space for myself in a way that I am not perfect, I am a human being, but I am able to use this and use the platform because to me, my opinion is that I love the art that I do. I love acting and I love all that. But sitting in the spotlight 
if you're not using it to shine light elsewhere, then what's the freaking point? I just, you know, what's the point? Like, I have, all of us has a voice, all of us have a voice, but some of us have different access. Right. You know, there's a different access point that you have, and, and I feel like it's like, how do you, what is the entrance point? I just heard DeRay McKesson um, speak, and he was saying, yes, and he was saying, you know, what is, how do we, access the entrance point with each other, that place that connects us, that allows us to understand each other and bring us into this new place that we're looking for that we don't yet know. How do we make space for that with curiosity, compassion, love, joy, and also the revolution of joy? Yes. You know, that revolutionary energy that actually is in the alchemy of that. When you have that bubble in your belly. I just thought I got really wired up there. No, I know. I'm ready to run into the streets. Sorry. No, no, more, more. It reminds me, Adam, you know, I know that the dream is that every out athlete is just an athlete, mm -hmm. that this is not a special moment. But it was such a special moment in 2018. Very moment. It was a, we have to mark the moment even though we, with, with bittersweet regret, note that it is still necessary. But suddenly you have access to an international platform mm -hmm. and, and you are beautiful and you are strong and you are winning and you're making friends all over the world. What was it like to have that international platform to say things that you needed to say, like to Mike Pence, for example, and I love you for that. It was an honor, and it was a responsibility I had been waiting for my mm. entire life. Just like you said earlier, when you have access, you are given not only the opportunity, but you have the, I feel, responsibility I to use it. Otherwise, there is no point to it. And I think now in a day and age where I think, speaking from the point of view of an athlete, before the only opportunity you had to get to know an athlete was a one minute or 30 second, two minute fluff piece that they did that was overproduced, that was this and that, that showed them waking up at 6 a.m., doing this, doing that, which is part of being an athlete, but now you have the opportunity to see what every athlete does every single day, every single minute. What is their daily routine? Who are they? What do they stand for? What's important to them? How are they gonna act with the platform that they have? And I felt like social media was such a powerful thing where it was a, it's a chance for me to one, engage with people. It's an, a chance for me to, to be funny, but it's a ch also a chance for you to see what am I made of? Why should you listen to me? What's, what do I have to say? Because y especially during the time of the Olympics, that's the time when I know that people are going to be listening. Mm. Yeah. And I said, I have, a, I have one chance. I missed making the Olympic team two times before. I was 28, my teammates were 17 and 18 years old. <laughs> I, I know that in my future, I'm not gonna go to another Olympics. The only other Olympics I'll go to is if Tracy Ellis Ross wants to come with me, we'll like do a package, <laughs> yeah, a vacation. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. the only other time yeah, I'll yeah. go. I know at 28 years old, this is my last opportunity. For better or for worse. For that. For that. Maybe. And I don't, I mean, I wouldn't say no to any of that for well, you. I say the world is your oyster. <laughs> well, for, for that moment. I understand that, yeah. Um, and I think, like you said, when you said what you thought being a feminist was. Mm. Being a feminist, there's a definition of what being a feminist is. And the definition is clear is that you believe in the equality of like both genders. Yep. That's the definition. That's it. That's it what doesn't you matter up. what you think what I think a feminist is. It doesn't matter. That's look it up in Webster's. The By the way, like, I went and looked it up too, and I was like, oh! I was so like, simple. The, why You're is everybody like, so upset? Yeah, there's no Birkenstocks anywhere. But I love Birkenstocks. <laughs> but I want to be clear, Birkenstocks are my favorite shoes. Not today, right? <laughs> they're my favorite shoes. But the, the definition is very clear of what it is. It doesn't matter what you think. I think as a gay person, sometimes you feel that you're only capable of being a best friend. 
I remember mm. um, <laughs> growing up, and I had a very close friend of mine, and she referred to me as her gay best friend, which, okay, one, I am gay, and I was her best friend. But for me, it felt like that was all I was allowed to be. And it felt like I was only allowed to be only just everybody's gay best friend. And I remember, um, it was maybe like six or seven years ago, I had a conversation with her and I said, if I'm, I, I don't care if I'm not your best friend, and I know that I am a gay friend of yours, but I don't wanna be your gay best friend. If I'm your best friend, please just call me your best friend. Ah, oh, that's nice. And, I think sometimes, like, gay men, I, well, I, I don't, can't speak for all gay men, but I know for me specifically, I know that sometimes you're expected to be, you're just the fun, sassy one, people, which I am. We have so much in common. Yeah. That's what people expect of me, too. <laughs> yeah. The fun, sassy one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, truly. Which, but it's true. Yes, you're expected but in casting, there's like a, you know. Of what you're supposed to be. What are yeah. you expected? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, like, I, uh, going to the Olympics, I said, I, it's, I'm allowed and I deserve to be the starring role in what I'm doing. Yes. Do you know what's so interesting? I didn't mean to cut you off, please. Please, whenever what's you want. What's so interesting <laughs> is I hear you using the exact same language that I have had to use as I create the narrative around who Bo Johnson is. Mm -hmm. yes. um, you know, and the fact that when I was nominated three years ago for the Emmy, it had been 32 years since a black woman had been nominated. And you look out across humanity and how many black women are in the lead position in their lives. And I was like, why has it been so long when that's what it is? Like, why am I relegated? Why are we relegated to some other place? Right. Um, and why is it revolutionary for that thing to be happening on television? But I hear so much in the, uh, so much parallel in the experience of what you're, you're expressing. Completely. Yeah. I, I, feel, I hear so, and when you tell your story, I, I, everything you say, I can change a few of the words and yeah, it feels and, like my own. Mm -hmm. Which, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Beaming like I had anything to do with your greatness or success. Like this with is our the new best buddy panel friendship. in the history of the world. Um, I will. I do want to um, not amend, but sort of expand on what I said before. In that, for me, the only point is to utilize my voice um, for something larger. I am not saying that it should be that for everyone. Because Agre I, think I agree that, too. I think that there is there are some people that honestly really shouldn't say anything. <laughs> No, that I was raised in a generation where if you didn't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Constructive criticism, not right. just on tenon like it is. Like, you know, there, like, there are ways that you, I long for people to utilize the time of listening and gaining information before using one's voice. Um, and that if that is not your thing, there are all ways, there are different ways for each of us to um, be active right. and to utilize our agency in how we help others. And not everybody, for not, not every, not for not every, no, not everyone should use their, you know what I mean, not yep. everyone should use their voice. Language. Some of us should just sit down and eat their food. That's well, what or you right. know, think about or it. Think what you have think to say. what you have to say, or you can give money, or you can give a hug, or you can be nice in your day, or you can show up for somebody in a different way. Not right. everybody is meant to do that. I'm saying for me, yep. um, I really feel like when I have those moments, I really do my research and I try and gather information and then ask myself, where do I stand on this? How do I feel about this? What feels true to me? Is there a way that I can answer this? And is there a way that I am pushing up against something that I actually need to question? You know, or have I decided something about somebody that requires some openness and some listening and some big heartedness that I am not reaching for automatically? Do I have a blind spot around this? I really try and ask myself those questions and allow myself the dignity of my own experience and my own humanity while allowing the same of other people. Right. You know, and giving people the space to be who they are, be in process, and know that I am not their higher power. I don't know what's right for them. I don't know what's on their path. But at the same time, you can't be hurting somebody else. Right, 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 right.
since you brought up Bo, um, I, I was wondering, if we would talk about work for just a, yeah, a yeah, quick yeah. second. Because you are in such a, a powerful position to shape the narrative of black women, mm -hmm. black professional women, black uh, women who with children, you know, with living in a complicated age, how have you been able to shape that character? Like, have you been able to work your way into the writer's room? I think you have. <laughs> I think you have. I use, Tell us everything. I use my voice. Um, <laughs> there have been small ways and big ways. Um, I have won some battles and I haven't won others. Um, it has been very important to me from the beginning that although the nature of our show is traditional in that it is told through the eyes of the That's husband, right. yeah. um, I have been very clear that in the limited real estate that Bo inhabits on Blackish, that I bring to it her full life and what must be happening off screen. Um, and sometimes that means on set a lot of, but why? Why am I doing that? <laughs> mm, mm, mm. You really think I have to be cooking again? Um, why am I carrying laundry right now? <laughs> now, there are moments, and I do laundry, I cook. You know, there are moments when that is appropriate and it is connected to the story, but I am always aware of the larger perspective and the larger context of what is happening in general on television. Um, I also, by the way, the other part of it is the ways that I sort of stretch and expand the real estate that I'm given, knowing that I am not in every scene. So when I speak up, I want to know that the fullness of who I am is there, but also in the way that I have named the narrative when I am not on the show. Yeah. The way that I have named who Bo is and the fact that she is not a surviving black woman, but she is a thriving black woman. That she is um, not just a wife, but she is a doctor. She, it's not that she's a wife, a doctor, a mother, a friend, a whatever. It's that she is all of those things. That I continue to name those publicly through the language and how I talk about her, um, I think is part of what etches us in time in changing and being revolutionary in how we are portrayed um, on television. Because our show, Blackish, is we are an American family. Um, and so I am portraying the American wife, or he's portraying the American husband, um, through the beingness and face of a black woman. Um, and so that is the responsibility of that. Um, and also, what I want that to be is always on my mind when we are crafting scenes and working. Well, you're doing a beautiful job. It's a wonderful show. It's a great I love every minute Very of it. Very proud of it. And I, I want to, I want to acknowledge the the terror of um, like I can almost I can't even think about it without tearing up of thinking that we might lose you with through preeclampsia and the way that oh. we were able to talk about. Um, the health healthcare issues that black women face. And then also we did the um, menopo uh, menopausal, uh-oh, is that what's on my mind? <laughs> 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 what happened there? <laughs> Why can't I think of, thank you, my God. <sighs> I was at work at six this morning in Los Angeles. So, so, so. <laughs> Everything's fine. Everything's I don't know. Fine. Am I Tracy and my bow? I don't know what's happening right now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the postpartum episode as well. Yes. I'm so proud of that. And I, I had never seen that done yeah. um, on television. And I really was so proud of the way they wrote it and the fact that Dre was not the antagonist right. in, in that he was sort of in the exploration of that right alongside her. He was not the thing I was pushing up against. Right. Um, and I thought that was very well done. Adam, I want to, um, you're at this sort of magical stage of life that I miss for myself, where you have just finished something remarkable and put a bow on this extraordinary time in your life and this great achievement, and you are now a fully realized adult that doesn't have to eat apples anymore if you don't want to, trying to figure out what you want to do and what oh, you right. care about I and know. where to use your platform. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you're deciding where you want to put your shoulder next. We were just talking about this earlier. Um, when we met, yeah, back there, <laughs> it was really fun. Yeah, <laughs> our our first moment when we locked eyes was very special. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I crawled right in her hair. <laughs> I sat in his lap. 
And I whispered in her ear and I was like, I'm safe now. <laughs> and I said, yes, you are. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> to go to the Olympics is like, it, when you get there and you have the opportunity to skate, it's one of the most terrifying uh. moments of your life. And while I was there, I knew that I wasn't just skating for myself. Mm. Before I had even gotten there, I ha like I know that I was there and everything that I was doing, I had already done everything I had wanted to do within my career. And, and to see how excited my mom and my coach were for me, I realized that I was doing this for them. Even getting to stand on the Olympic podium, I said, this is amazing and I'm freezing. <laughs> And I looked down and they were even colder than I was. And it was the moment for them, for them to see the flag. Mm. Um, I think one of the best things that ever happened to me was I even getting to do all of the media and get to talk with so many people and tell a few jokes here and there. I realized that like, that's what I really loved doing and that like, I would be able to find something past skating or find something next that I could be able to continue to do that. But I also knew while I was at the Olympics with everything going on, especially with Mike Pence, um, you know, you, you get a tweet from the vice president. You're like, oh, wasn't expecting that. Um, you know, mixed in with a tweet from Britney Spears and you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there is some yin to this yang. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I take the good with the bad. Um, and to, I had a really firm stance on where I felt with um, meeting Mike Pence, and I still stand, I still am firmly in that stance that it's um, a waste of time. I, f I felt to meet with the vice president, especially before the biggest competition of my life. Yep. My job as a US citizen and a US athlete was to go to the Olympics and to represent my country to the best of my ability. To do that to the best of my ability, that meant being exactly who I am, represent myself. <laughs> because also to, to piggyback on what you had said, about you do your research. Mm. Um, people can smell through the bullshit now. They can smell through it because you have access to so much information. Google it. <laughs> <laughs> like you can find out anything and, and they can find out if you've done your research and if you haven't done your research, you look like you have egg on your face. If I don't know how to spell a word, I Google it. Do I still spell a part wrong? Yeah, I do. I spell <laughs> it as one word sometimes. I'm not perfect. <laughs> I have to spell out schedule. It's fine. Schedule? Schedule. Schedule. I don't know. But, I, but, you know, between getting a tweet from the vice president and getting heckled by the Trump family, I, you realize in that moment, that's when I realized that like my skating wasn't for me anymore. I was like skating for a lot of other people. Mm. And because I had like trained so hard and everything I had done, I remember when I came out publicly, my mom was like, don't do it. Right, right. Um, and she was like, do, my mom was always like my number one champion of everything. I said, mom, I, when I told my mom I was gay, she said, I know. Which, like, I had always thought I was like an actress on Blackish at that point. <laughs> so many parallels. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm so whitish, though. <laughs> but, you know, I, you know, so my mom's like, yeah, I know. And then I tell my mom that, like, especially after the Sochi Games, um, when there was this huge um, legislation that was pushed by Russia that gay propaganda was illegal. So we as athletes didn't know what that meant. And in this like rock bottom of not making the Olympic team, I started doing things that were important. I said, I'm going to be out. And I made sure I was out and skating really, really well. And so I, I was out, and after I was out, I won my national title because I didn't want to be, uh, you know, skating bad and be like, hey, well, I'm bad, fat, but, and gay. <laughs> so I was like, I want to make sure I'm in a really good place, so I represent 
that young kid really well. And when I went to the Olympics, I was like, I'm skating for all of these people. So I had the strength from that event to know that like, I'm not gonna let myself down right. for what I need to do next, right. whatever that is. Just, the time is just ticking away. It is. I'm so sad to be saying goodbye soon, but we have a few more minutes. Okay. I okay. know. I know. I love it up here. I, <laughs> <laughs> you feel the love and the energy and the excitement and the optimism. So, Adam, I know one of the things that you're very interested in right now are um, getting out the vote. Mm -hmm. Focus oh. on the election. Midterms, midterms, midterms. <laughs> Me too, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we could talk about the simple things that people can do to make sure that, that people feel represented and get out there and push past the voter suppression barriers and start voting. Yeah, well, I've been working with the DNC. I've been working with MTV. Uh, I've been working with um, Michelle Obama's When We All Vote. Uh, it's just, you know, right now is, is the time, if there ever was a time. You, you know, 2016 was the time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. And now there's another time. Yeah. <laughs> But, whoop! <laughs> I think people need to take a, a look, and they need to take a look inside and be like, because of social media, you're able to see where you stand for and what you're passionate about. Well, I do think that you are absolutely correct. Um, there is more to it in terms of, especially um, in the black community around voting. Um, <laughs> This is an area where I wish I was more informed, um, but there are real voter suppression things going on, uh, gerrymandering, like there is a lot happening. So what I would say to everybody is, um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, make sure that you are making yourself available to those around you. It can be embarrassing to admit that you are not registered, to admit that you actually don't know how to do something like that, how to get yourself registered. There are a lot of people who cannot vote, which means that your vote really actually does matter. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's really about taking the shame off of this and allowing space for people to ask the questions that they need to ask, get themselves informed, and really access the right kind of information. And I think because so many people are um, engaged right now, people are available to help. All those social media things where it says text this number and find out where you're registered, if you're registered, all that kind of stuff, really do that. And I know that so social media can be incredibly helpful. It can also encourage a passi passivity that I, encourage on top of that to say, don't allow that, don't allow a like to make you think you're doing something. Um, that is, it's one form of using your voice, but there really is action involved here. And uh, I have learned through my life that self-esteem comes from esteemable acts. And one of the most esteemable acts that I have ever taken is voting. And then the next phase beyond that is supporting other people in getting registered and getting to the polls. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If you aren't ashamed to text Postmates that you want McDonald's at 12 a.m., don't be ashamed <laughs> to text Michelle Obama's When We All Vote campaign <laughs> if you're registered. Yeah. I only have one last question. Mm. Do you feel the love in the room for you two today? I feel the love, not for me, just the love. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your warmth and your you. beautiful questions and your thoughtful words. And I don't know that I feel the love for me, but I feel the love. Yes. Because that is what's out here. And yes. that can be a thing to propel you into action. It is a beautiful place to be in the heart of Salesforce country. I will tell you that. And, <laughs> that and sounded cute. It was really nice. And it just, you are, you know, as public figures, you represent us um, in so many ways. You're our friends in our heads. You know, we think we know you mm -hmm. and to have you be. What happened, what happened, what happened? Right. What did you do? Me, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> To have you be exactly as joyful and serious and dedicated as we believed that you were, it's just, it just gives us hope to move ahead. Am I right? Yeah. Thank you.
We love you. We love you. Thank you.